Thank you for coming. So, my session, for good or for worse, uh, making happy client relationships, first-hand experiences, um, from supplying digital services uh, from the past 25 or so years, some heartfelt lessons that I, um, that I got, some tips that you may be useful in your day-to-day -day operation, day-to-day -day digital services. I'm gonna be standing here because there's a, a recording and uh, they, want, they want me in the, in the picture, apparently, so. Um, so yeah, there's a, it isn't uh, as much a method or a structure that I'm going to present uh, to you uh, as much as it is uh, uh, um, uh, some first-hand experiences of the things that I learned and some tips that I might want to share with you today. So my name is Imrich Melech Meiling. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm with a digital agency called React Online from Holland, together with my business partner Jean-Paul, he's here today. Uh, I'm at Drupal.org for 16 years and 10 months or so. Yesterday, I was formally instated as a board member of the Drupal Association, and um, I'm also at the DrupalCon Europe Advisory Committee. So, hi, good morning, welcome. Please do come in. There's plenty of spaces across the room. So, um, in this session, uh, there's uh, five topics that I'd like to cover. In, um, so, how to do digital projects with inexperienced agile teams. That's on both sides, uh, but in particular on the side of uh, agencies and service providers, uh, which I'm from. So how to deliver digital services within time and budget, and some uh, things that I learned from there. Uh, prevent from overpromising. The trick there is not to make any promises, um, but do deliver on commitments. Delivering bad news, which is not always as bad as it sounds, and negotiating, negotiating contracts that are not agile. So, um, off onto the first topic, how to do digital projects with inexperienced agile teams. So, a question to the group. Who of you were, ha, is with a digital service provider, an ICT supplier, who, who does supplying digital services, websites, platforms, right, okay. So, who is, who is using Drupal um, in their day-to-day -day operations and relying on an external party for, for the website? So a client, as we call it, that's also a few. Right, okay, so these things are for like uh, very insightful for both sides of the table. I'll be talking uh, to digital service providers uh, most of the time, but I'd be very interested to hear from you how you experience working with digital service providers and the things that we learned and how we can learn from, from you and vice versa. So uh, those using Drupal, feel free to stay. Uh, it's very interesting to hear. Uh, the first step in getting the lack of experience, um, sometimes bad experience, which often times uh, happens a lot as well, is to take that head on. Now, there is a concept, a psychological concept called the fight or flight response. Has anyone heard of this, the fight or flight response? Yeah? Uh, quite a few, right. Okay, so this is sort of a primal thing for people that ultimately under threat, right? Um, when there's no other option, people will fight or flee. So here's the definition. Um, the reaction starts in the brain and spreads through the body to make adjustments for the um, best defense or flight reaction, right? So I think a lot of this is going on in the world, right? also in our day-to-day -day lives sometimes, how we do business and it runs through everything that we do when we allow it, right? It all depends on how you look at things. Um, fear sometimes comes from an idea that you have. We had an amazing, inspiring keynote about that uh, yesterday, right? Or from bad experiences, which is also oftentimes the case. So obviously, fear kills the basis for trust or at least is it quite a big impediment for it, right? So. How do you overcome that when you start working on a business relationship together uh, on digital projects? So I'm a sci-fi fan. I watch Star Trek from time to time. Um, no worries if you're not a Trekkie. It's just an analogy to uh, illustrate uh, the concept. Uh, but this here is the Vulcan mind meld, right? The Vulcans from Star Trek. That's a race, and apparently that's something that only they can do. The Vulcan mind melt is a touch technique that allows a Vulcan to merge a Vulcan's mind with the essence of another one's mind. 
So in Star Trek, apparently Vulcans, they're not um, supposed to uh, show their emotions. Um, essentially, it lets other people see the world through, through their eyes, uh, the way they, uh, they uh, experience it, their uh, emotions, their memories, and so forth. Oftentimes, the scenes is an emotional scene in the series. Uh, because in a very short moment, a lot of knowledge and everything is sort of transferred from one mind to another. And that, this gave me the idea for an agile mind meld. And doing an agile mind meld onboarding session with, with each other, with our clients. Or kickoff, if you're not into track. Um, and it's a well-prepared session that allows you to um, uh, take your client and let them see the world through your eyes. Right? Tell them how the game is played. Be very open about the caveats and the pitfalls and everything that you will encounter because that is, go that is going to happen. And I always invite um, like the teammates, the management team to that session, right? It, it, takes, it takes a bit of time, but it's incredibly rewarding and refreshing to have, them, to have each other at the table early on um, and take them through how you see the world and how we will play the game together at the very start. So we talk about um, how, we do, how we work, we do Agile, how we do uh, backlog refinements, how at certain points things may not uh, work out as we planned, how maybe we need to let go of some of the scope, the risks that are involved, uh, the good and the bad, right? So we're very open about that and I encourage you all to, um, to uh, take on a session like this, an Agile kickoff uh, together take the time, two hours or so, invite management and all, and talk about these things, about what will happen. So let's talk about uh, ownership for a little bit. So uh, in particular, the part that's being played by the product owner, right? Um, the concept of a product owner in Agile often needs some explaining. So in many cases, it's the project manager role, right, on both sides. So. There's a question, who, who actually refers to when you talk to your clients, hey, I, I, need, uh, I need the product owner, I need you in your capacity as a product owner. Who refers to your client as product owner? Right, so that's just a few, right? So, in, so who refers to the client contact as project manager? Right. So is there someone, um, someone of you who uses Drupal, relies on a an external digital service provider that has a product owner in-house. Is there someone? There's no hands, right. So, okay, so we talk about this a lot, about the importance of product ownership. Um, so there's different definitions. I, I like this one, it's, it's clear and simple, but not always obvious. And I highlight in particular the part uh, about the person in particular that will make decisions involving time and money. And this is crucial. And this is, this is from the sales deck, by the way. We also have it in our Agile Mind Melt. And we repeat this often. And here's Kim. And Kim is product owner with one of our clients. And this is what I do at the very start when we, when we pitch or when we, when we meet. There hasn't been signed off anything. I take the previous slide. I find a photo of the, the person who's going to be in charge, who's going to be our contact person, and say, this is the product owner with face and all. And I, again, stress the fact that she's going to be taking decisions involving time and money. Um, and in quite a few cases, there's people, uh, two, one or two people that will sit up straight and say, oh, but that's not her who's going to be doing that, that's me. And that's the point where I'll say, okay, then you will be our contact and product owner because I cannot go back and forth all the time and manage your, uh, um, uh, your team as much as I like to because that will take time away of making software, right? So it's very important that we have someone that has mandate uh, and authority to make those decisions. So at one point, it will most certainly come to, uh, to a stage where we have to make decisions on doing things differently, let go of some scope. Um, there's also people that will um, come in and say, hey, but we promised or you guys said that you would deliver this or in the contract it says this, so you need to add this as well. And I'm like, uh, no, that was Kim's well thought out decision. So I always tell our clients, you gotta become very close friends with Kim 
because if, if you want something done, she's the boss of the wallet. She manages the backlog, she tells us what to do. So if blue suddenly needs to be green, talk to Kim, right? So lessons learned, uh, recognize and appreciate the fact that there's going to be doubt sometimes, there's going to be changes, things will not go out as planned, but take the time to do that agile kickoff. Um, if you're not into track lore, kick off onboarding session, whatever you want to call it, and be very open and explain how you work. So let them see the world through your eyes, um, the good and the bad. Be open and honest. Um, talk about agile values, how the things are working, the sessions or whatever project management method that you employ. Uh, so without product ownership, there's little chance to get what you want, right? It's an essential role uh, that we need to have, so you must explain that. So, second, how to deliver digital services within time and budget. Well, the trick is make it so it fits the budget. So, that sounds easier said than done, right? So, how do we do it? Um, it is one of the most repeated things that we have in our projects though. We say it very often. So it's in our slide decks, it's in our proposals, stressed in capitals, it's, it's repeated during the process. Nobody wants a project that will run over budget, right? So the budget is always like this, this rock solid thing. We can mold the scope, but the, but the budget is what it is. Yes, we can go back and get more budget. Yes, you can go to management and say, hey, we're going to add this or this, but the budget is very fixed in our, in our uh, projects, but there's always tension between the project and all the stuff that people want because it's, it's the opportunity to squeeze in as many things as possible and say, oh, cool, but then we also need this, and then, by the way, we talked about this. So um, I see a lot of proposals out there um, that we get also where uh, organizations are looking for a partnership as long as they get anything they need and want. And that's everything about managing expectations. So um, there's often this quite long list of all the things and features that need to be in there. And there's two things there. First is you need to ask, how can you be sure you need all these features, right? Did you do your due diligence? Did you talk to people? What, where's the data? Where's the business goals or the, or the other goals that um, justify all these features, right? So why don't, let you, why don't you let us help you figure out what features you need and what's best? Because that's, that's our passion. That's what we do best, right? So um, the second thing is that um, your client, contact person, product owner needs to learn to say no, right? So uh, that's... That's a hard thing, and you need to help them. Uh, it might not go right right away, uh, but the person must learn to make choices based on budget, business goals, and you must help, help them discern what's most important. Um, and so, um, Hendrik Knieberg has a wonderful uh, video, and I encourage you strongly to, uh, to watch this. It's about 15 minutes. I use this a couple of times in, in uh, work sessions in the past. I show this to people sometimes. I have about 40 seconds to show you. Oh, we don't have the sound. Okay. Okay, we don't have the sound. So um, the slides will be shared. Uh, I have the link, but I strongly encourage you to look up um, the video. So, uh, to illustrate, Aiden Speakermont is an agency in, uh, in, um, with various uh, offices in the, um, Europe and the US. Um, and it's, it's, a quite, it's a bit forward, but there's two things that stand out. Um, we work for your customers, we may have to take their side at times, uh, which was very appealing to me. It's like, yes, exactly, this is, this is the understanding that we were trying to get when working together. And we're not suppliers, right? Partnerships get the best result. So let us work together on finding out what you need instead of supplying us this whole long list of features. So lessons learned is uh, work together to find uh, what it is that you'll actually need. So uh, that's sometimes hard. So uh, we're so happy if we can find, uh, come to that stage 
uh, where there's a mutual understanding that yes, we don't know yet what we need and we need you guys to help us figure that out in a way that fits the budget. It's always, that line comes always second. Um, help them say no. No doesn't mean no never. I always tell, tell them no, not now. So we always talk about no, not now. It can be next month, it can be in the next increment. If it needs to be in there, we need to look for a way to get something else out because the budget is fixed, right? We're not suppliers. Partnerships gets, gets the best results. Um, prevent from overpromising. There's only one way to do it. Don't make any promises. And that sounds like an easy escape, right? So we have contracts. Oftentimes we're contract bound, but it doesn't mean we cannot have any commitment. So I always tell our clients we are committed to delivering the best possible result in a way that fits the budget. But we need to figure that out yet. So estimating is hard. Um, right, so when we have like uh, sort of an outline uh, or a backlog or a design, then we need to say, okay, what will fit? We need to estimate what will fit in the budget. So whether it's story points or t-shirt sizes or, or the good old hours, ultimately, that's what you need. Uh, estimates become fluid or they could become off. Um, oftentimes, you know, they're wrong. Um, I'll admit to that. So. Um, you can't have it all, right? It's naive to think that there is a budget set that we've signed off on and you kept, and we can all keep squeezing things in, right? That's, that's not possible. So um, things change, priorities shift, things may be added, things that we have overlooked, things that our clients have overlooked. I often say, well, there's gonna be a few things that you haven't thought of that we might have now, but we cannot see our all ends, right? We cannot see everything. So there's a lot of mantras from the, from the previous slides. Another important lesson is to do those estimates together, right? So when it comes down to it, when it comes down to actually sharing the marbles and, and um, defining what can we do for the budget. Here's a, a photo of a project that I did for the Port of Rotterdam. It's just like multi a global, quite big project. Took, took us over a year to complete the entire scope. And here's what we did at that time. Uh, we had like all the tables in one room, in one, one long row with a black tape in the end. And I printed out all the user stories from Yira at that day. And we laid them out in a long row and we invited all these stakeholders and the product owner to come in uh, and work out what could be done for the remainder of the budget. And this was a very refreshing session because they were actually making the case to one another as to why their uh, epic or stories needed to go first, right? So it also confronts your client or, or in the stakeholders or whoever is from the business or, or actually going to work or need all this stuff in to look your team in the eye and understand why things are sometimes hard to build. So they feel the pain of your, of your creative staff or your development staff, and they see, ah, okay, so that's why it takes three days to build this. Well, I thought it was like a couple of hours, right? They don't always get it the first time or right away, but to look each other in the eye and see each other's pains and gains actually creates this, this, this base for taking a hit from one another. Also, the team gets a feel as to why certain things are so important for your client. So estimates, Black backlog refinements, sprint reviews, do as much of them as, as you can together, actually all of them. So the very key is trust, uh, learning each other, and um, yeah, so for the process to go smoother and, and have a feel of why things are so important or a feel as to why things are hard to make. That's, that was very refreshing. Obviously you can do this online from the tool or in a, in a call, right? But this is what we did at the time. So the lessons learned here is commitments are not promises, right? Estimates are, are not actuals and planning is guessing. Yes, we're doing an estimate. We've, we've worked a day to get this estimate out, but it's an estimate. It's, it's, it's not gonna be reality. It might be, uh, and sometimes it is. Sometimes actually it's even less, but it's an estimate, not an actual. 
I can promise you that we will do our utmost best to get everything out inside our estimate, right? So do the estimates together, backlog refinements and the sessions as much as possible. Um, yeah, and people will, will more easily want to work in common success when they understand each other's needs and pains. Delivering bad news is not always as bad as it sounds, but it's best served early and straight up, right? So at some point, something will go different. Uh, your designer might be sick, project manager might be out, uh, some technical re there's a hundred reasons, right? So the Agile Manifesto says responding to change over following a plan. Well, you know what? Mistakes will occur, right? Um, setbacks will occur. We all know it. It's part of life, so it's part of software development too. Um, when there is a change of plans, discuss it straight up. Early and often is one of our mantras that we repeat a lot as well. Uh, and sometimes our people are not happy with bad news, right? You can Bob Ross them all you want. <laughs> they won't take no for an answer. Well, you know what? I won't take no for an answer too. So when people tell me, no, we can't do this, like it's, there's a technical thing, and say, well, but what can we do? So you must look for no, but what we can do is this. I repeat this a lot. So no, we can't do it. It takes more time. Okay, but what can we do? Right? So no is not good enough. I need to hear no, but what we can do is this. So a few, a few weeks ago, we had some adjacent panels and it, they couldn't be adjacent. So we had them stacked. And by the way, it was also better for accessibility. Uh, we called the client right away, say, hey, it's not going to be like in the design, but we're going to do it like this and your accessibility, accessibility is better too. Problem solved, client happy. That happens a lot, right? So if you put effort into it, work to know, but what, what we can do is this. So when your client puts their foot down and say, oh, well, that's all, all well and nice, but you said at the start this and I need this, I'm, I'm going to repeat, say, hey, this is what we've been saying from the start, right? Setbacks will occur. Um, because why is it when we hit a snack, I need to pay for it? Right? This is what we're partners for. So there's three questions daily, um, and this is sticky on top in our sprint planning, and we, we ask them daily uh, in the team, in the daily stand-up. Is anything holding you back um, from achieving what's in the user story or the design? Is anything going to be different from what's specified in the user story or the design? And is anything taking up more or less time than we estimated? If either one of those is a yes, we need a breakout and we need to contact the client, the product owner, project manager early and often. So that's what we do. Uh, the sooner, the less waste. So lessons learned, bad news, best serve up, served straight up um, without hesitation or twisting around. Changes and setbacks will occur. It's a setback of life. Don't take no for an answer. Look for no, but what we can do is this. And do that early and often. So, um, we're going smooth and fast. So, negotiating contracts that are not agile. By the way, there's um, uh, a Q&A at the end. I was, I was planning on doing that just as we go along to have some of the interaction going, but uh, the room is quite big, so um, you can put the questions in the app, but it's fine to, uh, if you can remind them, if you can remember them to, uh, to have them come, and I'll come with the mic, whatever you want, or we'll see, yeah? Negotiating contracts that are not agile, well, contracts in most cases aren't agile, right? So there's, there's a lot of, uh, at the start, these RFPs and specification documents and, and briefings that will say we're looking for a partnership, so do we, right? But when it comes to the contracts, there is no partnership to be seen anywhere. <laughs> so we have a saying, contracts can make a friend or an enemy, good contracts make good friends. Well, the Agile, Mani Agile Manifesto is talking about customer, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, right? It doesn't mean we don't need contracts, we don't have contracts, of course we do. Uh, it just means that we also value uh, a lot on the partnership. Now, this is me at Universal Studios, a few years younger. Um, I'm a huge Back to the Future fan, sci-fi fan, if you haven't noticed. 
Uh, for those who aren't, no worries. This is uh, the, the car is a time machine, a DeLorean. It plays a huge part in the films. Um, so why this picture? A lot of stuff that happens in contracts are about things that happen or might happen in the future or how things may play out, right? So let me explain this. I have three basic rules for contracts. Um, I will not commit contractually to something I cannot control uh, or risks that may be all on my side in the future, right? Things will not always go as, out as, uh, as planned. If I need to take all the risk, that's outdated. I literally, t I literally say that. So I will not work harder if, if, if I get a penalty penalized with money. If, if you need penalties or incentives, I want them to be mutual because that's what the partnership is about. But to be honest, I don't believe in if you pay me more, I work harder because we already work hard and there are so many hours in a day, right? We're also in the effort business. So hours um, are not results. Right, so we'll, we will be defining the result together. Um, I will commit to helping you yours though. So a few examples. Um, this is, this is con contract text, so I have to actually read this. Um, in any circumstance where deliverables will not be delivered in uh, time in accordance with the preset agreement or is different from it, contractor is neglecting the terms and conditions and is liable for Consequences, including financial consequences, right? This is this can be in a contract or an agreement that's that comes with all the happy documents. And this is what I send back. I said, well, I have a counter proposal to that. So I will say that we first and immediately get together and try to solve before we are held liable in any way, because that's what a partnership is about. Contractor will uphold the application, it is a good one, uh, to the latest standards, laws and regulations and requirements as stated by the law and the latest version of our security standards and technical policies. It should always be in accordance with the latest increment, should it change. This is a back to the future moment for me, because <laughs> I don't have a time machine. How I cannot, we, we can't know what the law will be in the future, what regulations or what changes you will make to your requirements, right? So this is what I counter. I cannot accommodate the possible future requirements if they are to be met. Changes will be put forward through the product backlog by the product owner, provided they are technically, legally and otherwise feasible. Client absorbs all costs, risks and additional consequences just as with any addition this is a knockout for our further participation. Well, I might, you know, if, if we negotiate and it becomes a little bit different, I might change my mind anyway, but I will put my foot down here because I will not commit to something that may be very risky to me in the future. And I'd be very interested to hear from, from you who are relying on external uh, parties, and I might actually be on, on the side of the table writing this, how you would experience this. So and how you cope with, with, with these contract negotiations on that. So uh, there's lots more um, um, examples, uh, but the lessons learned is don't commit to something you can't control. It will work against you sooner or later. You know, in many cases, you know, contracts will not come out of the drawer, uh, but in some cases they do. And sometimes uh, we need to be very strict about the agreements that we make, right? So if you need to take to take all the risk, that's not a partnership, right? I, I say to clients then, well, we, we have conversations about let's, okay, let's uh, amp the budget with 30% because you're moving all the risks to my side. But that's outdated and old fashioned. I, I literally say that. Setbacks will occur. So are we doing this for good or for worse or not at all? And contracts are always negotiable. So name your terms. I, I've had legal People call me up and say, hey, I, I saw your counterproposal to our agreement, but that's not how it works. So definitely that's how it works. It's a negotiation, right? Don't let any, anyone tell you otherwise. Uh, you can always talk about these things. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. So 
I'm going to walk over there. Um, on, the, on the laptop, there's going to be, if there are any questions. Test, test. Yes, this works. So let me see. I think I have to. <laughs> and I can also come to you if you have any question. <laughs> right. So. So, OK, so there is a question from, from Lucas. Lucas, are you here? Hi, right, thank you for your question. Uh, what do you do if the client cannot provide a product owner? So that's a good question, right? So, um, can, you all, can you all hear me? Is this working? Yeah, OK. So, yeah, so what we do is we go through this process. We go through the definition. And we're like, OK, so we understand that you don't have a product owner, but we need a person who's going to walk this journey with us almost on a daily basis. You know, if we are to make software and you, you have only uh, an afternoon every three weeks, then we're not your party, right? It's not gonna work, it's a recipe for disaster. So whether they call them product owner or not, but we need this person that fits this criteria. Another option is for them to hire a product owner, which, which happens regularly, so that's what we do. Are there any other questions? Anyone? Feel free. Tough questions are also fine. Yep, I'm coming to you. Hey. Good. Um, my question's around um, contracts, and you know, it always does come up. Uh, you know, I am the main person at my organization that deals with all contracts, and. <clears throat> They're tricky, and I wanted to know your opinion on more specificity in a contract or more vagueness in a contract. Okay, thank, thanks, John. So, so you mean is um, like make it more vague or more explicit, or? I, I sometimes I feel like if you add too many details to a contract, then you're going to be held to every detail, like bullet point by bullet point, right? So. And I've had that happen. And so when I write my contracts, I write them slightly vague so that they can be interpreted in times of question, right? Rather than like, you're putting on a login form. More like, login will be part of the website, right? I mean, sort of like, if they catch you in a knit, that's what I'm trying to say, is like, you don't want to write too much specificity. Yes, thank you, yes. So I, I don't think there's like a silver bullet answer, like a one size fits all, but yes. So this is what we do sometimes and happens, is where we, um, just like you say, say, hey, let's leave this a little generic. And we, if we can both agree on that, that's perfect, right? Because uh, let's make an MVP out of the contract and don't set anything, all, every detail in stone. So yes, that's what we do sometimes as well. Thank you. Yeah. I saw two hands. So the question is about your success rate. How many people do you think that you're talking to are wandering off because of your way to work with them? That's a good question. Um, to be honest, I have, I've had one or two that said, well, you know what, if we have to spend a day a week with you, we're not gonna do it. We're not gonna be able to do that. So, that, so be it, yeah. It's always tough, especially when you need the work. There might always be some molding where you get together, but ultimately, yes, sometimes it happens, but it's not huge, but it happens. Thanks. Um, I have a smaller company. We're only with six people, um, and our products, our projects are not that big. Um, but how formal is your communication with the customer? For example, if they don't deliver what they are promising they would deliver, uh, content or whatever, and they don't deliver, do you uh, call them and then uh, write a formal email to say this is what we discussed at the, uh, at the phone because afterwards if there is a problem, you have something you can fall back to uh, or how do you do that? Yeah, so, so thank you for that. So the mantra is early and often, so whatever it happens, we call them right away and that's quite informal, so hey, uh, we're falling behind, we need this, we can give you another day or two and we always write that down in Confluence or in the, in the user story, say, hey, this is, this is what we agreed on. You have 48, 48 more hours, but we need it by then, right? So that's what we do. Not like really a formal email, but we put everything in Atlassian, <coughs> that's what we use, right? Um, but this, 
this is a good example of if, if, if there is a, a contract and a client that needs to have everything written in stone like this, which sometimes happens, say, hey, okay, we need to have everything formal, right? Uh, and I get a <coughs> penalty if I don't deliver in time. That's when I use the example, ah, okay, so when you don't deliver in time, I'm going to send you an extra invoice as well. And they, that's, that's a weird concept oftentimes, but that's like, if we make a partnership out of, of that, that's the example that I use, but it, it seldom comes to that. So anyway, to answer your question. Yeah, coming over. I think we have a few more minutes. So how much um, project management and meetings time do you include in your contracts and do you name it as such or do you pour it, pour it over the other um, points in there? Good question, thank you. Yes, so uh, we explicitly have a line that says 20, 25, 30% project management uh, or scrum. That's what we call it. Um, and it depends on, on the relationship. It depends on the situation. Uh, it differs from time to time. Sometimes that, that goes up, right? You need more time together to work things out because that's the type of relationship, the type of client. Uh, but we explicitly put it in there saying about well, 30% or something is overhead. That's what's needed. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. That's Yeah. Yes. Yes. Cus customers are looking for that and say, "Hey, can we can we reduce that? Why do you need three people at the table? Because if I only have one, right? I need to explain. Details will fall away. They don't feel your pain. It's gonna ultimately sometimes cost twice as much. So, yeah. But it's always a tension point. Any other questions? Yes. I, I got a um, answer, uh, question regarding your uh, proposals. So let's say you got an RFP, and uh, how deeply you describe these um, uh, conditions in your proposals? I mean, for example, the penalties. So do you do you describe that these are your uh, basically ideal propo ideal uh, conditions? So, so what you mean is, uh, do we put penalties explicitly in, or leave them out? So if you respond to an RFP, do you describe these uh, preferred conditions? Uh, yes. So yes. So when we get like the conditions and agreement from the client, and this stuff is in it, I will counter that. Uh, but yes, we also have our our agreement and conditions that obviously are well how we see a partnership. And these are ideal to ours, so that's what we use. And they, it's like a mutual thing. So if we do the same thing as what I like clients do, and I don't want it, that's not going to work, right? So it needs to be mutual. So yes, we have an ideal uh, thing what we want. Okay, so I think I'm going to release the room uh, for the next one to set up. Um, again, thank you very much for coming and your time, and <laughs> see you, see you out there.